On this episode of Coding 101, we're back to programming with Lou Maresca. This time he's here with the Holiday Pricer. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Coding 101 is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Coding 101 is brought to you by Lynda.com. Lynda.com is an easy and affordable way to help you learn. Instantly stream thousands of courses created by experts on business, software, web development, graphic design, and more. For a free trial, visit Lynda.com slash C101. That's L Y N D A dot com slash C101. And by Squarespace, the all in one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. Now introducing Squarespace 7 with even better site management tools and other improvements. For a free two week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code C101. Welcome to Coding 101. It's the show where we let you into the wonderful world of the Code Monkey. I'm Father Robert Palliser, the digital Jesuit. I'm here with uh, our Code Warrior, Mr. Lou Maresco. Lou, thank you and welcome back to Coding 101. Thanks, Padre. Thanks for having me back. Appreciate it. Now, when we were talking about this episode, we knew that well, it's, it's a slightly modified Coding 101 format. So we've been doing a lot of interviews. Uh, the wild card went one longer than we normally do. But now we're getting back into coding. But rather than teaching lessons, we're going to show people how to actually make applications, how to make programs that they may want for themselves. And you've come up with a doozy. You're calling it the holiday pricer, although uh, someone in the chat room, who is that? Uh, chicken head or kicking back? A uh, kicking back says it should be Santa's little helper. And that's it's actually, <laughs> I really like that, Santa's little helper. Uh, explain to me what was your idea of coming up with this program? You bet. So I think every every holiday season, you know, the, the Black Fridays, the Cyber Mondays, even just before Christmas, I always get tired of kind of going to the sites and seeing what the prices and how they change and kind of tracking that information. There are sites that do it. Some of them charge you. Some of them, you don't really know what they're actually doing behind the scenes. So there's a lot of things going on. And I just wanted to have something for myself, you know, something <laughs> that I can run. I know what, exactly what it's doing. It's going to track exactly the products that I want. Um, and it's it's agnostic of the site that I go to, that kind of thing. So that's kind of the motivation behind it. And see, I, I like this because this is this is sort of that uh, that top down rather than the bottom up approach. You've got an idea, and the idea is simple. It's it's solving a problem that you may have, especially around the holiday time, which is there might be an item or two that you want. You j you want that, but you want to know exactly when it drops in price or exactly when it's available, and uh, that's what your program is going to let us do. Right, exactly. But before we get that, there's actually some very exciting news out of Redmond. And this is why I wanted you back for the, the first module after the wild cards. Uh, we, we were actually going to do Pearl, but when I read this, I said, oh, Lou's got to come back. He's got to talk <laughs> about this. One of the issues that we've always had with the C-sharp modules, because remember, we've done two so far, has been people say, well, it's Windows-specific. You know, unless you're running a Windows system, why are you going to want to use .NET? Why would you want to use C-sharp? Well, Lou, you want to tell us a little something something about what happened at Redmond about, what, a week and a half ago? You bet. So, I mean, originally the C-sharp language was open source, which means that the language itself, the language spec, the entire thing was kind of open source, allowed people like the um, mono people to kind of build up framework around Linux and, and OS X that was kind of third party and allowed them to have things like uh, Xamarin Studio and stuff like that to be able to build on Mac, but it wasn't really supported directly by people who created it, that being Microsoft. So just recently, like you said last week, uh, Microsoft has decided to kind of open source the entire thing. Not only the, the language itself, but the compiler and the platform uh, and making it readily, soon readily available for on all of these platforms, whether it be Linux or Mac or OS X or or Windows. So that's kind of the key. Is it's just it's 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 breaking open the entire thing, and it also allows you to build apps like Android and iOS apps directly on 
uh, inside of Visual Studio, which is another huge, huge kind of leap forward for everyone who likes Visual Studio too. Yeah. Now, now uh, Redmond has announced that they're going to be releasing the entire .NET server stack. So everything that has to do with serving things out, connecting back to databases, creating right. pages, that's all completely open source. They are holding back a tiny bit on the client side, but as you said, if you want to develop in .NET for Android or OS X, that's now completely possible. Oh, what I like about this is they're going to be working with Xamarin, specifically the Xamarin-sponsored group known as Mono, to create the framework, the .NET framework based on C Sharp for both Android and, uh, and OS X, and I'm assuming eventually for iOS, which right. means it, we're getting down to that true write once, compile many times. Write it, compile it for Windows, compile it for OS X, compile it for Android, which is Linux. Uh, how does that change the game for you as a developer? It's huge because I'm, <clears throat> I mean, a majority of the code that I write is C sharp. It's all in the kind of what we call the Windows stack. But now it gives me that ability, that that experience that I have to kind of take it forward and move it to these other platforms. I think a lot of Java developers today kind of have that experience because they can build it for Android. They can build it for OS X. They can build it for Windows. They can build it, build it for Linux. What they didn't have is like iOS. Uh, and so now this kind of opens the door to that uh, for C Sharp as well. As it gives that ability to kind of go across platform and be able to use really cool IDEs like Visual Studio. I mean, to me, it doesn't matter who you talk to, whether a Windows developer or not, Visual Studio is really kind of the, uh, the, the pinnacle in IDE web uh, development for web and, and, and uh, programming today. So it's, it's, it's a really cool app. Oh, we've got Sideways in the chat room who's saying, oh, .NET is a marketing scheme, whereas Microsoft forces you to buy new OS and hardware to be able to use their ID to write code on. And that's something I've heard a lot. In fact, when we, were, when we did the first two modules, they were all saying, oh, so you just want us to buy Windows. So you just, no, that's what this whole announcement is about. You don't. In fact, Microsoft's going to be releasing a fully featured, a fully functional version of the, uh, of the uh, Visual Studio Right. for everyone to use. So, you know, they're not going to break it down. Th this is really going to hurt the bottom line because Microsoft was making a lot of money. Uh, and, you know, maybe that's not a, a topic for, for this particular show. But, Lou, I'd love to hear your, uh, your insight on why now, why do this when Microsoft could have just kept it the old way and, again, yeah, forced people to use Windows, forced people to buy new hardware rather than just say, here you go, and, and we hope you develop for it. I don't know. I think, I think personally, I think that most of the narrow, that Microsoft has had a narrow scope around enterprise and around like Windows apps and no Windows phone apps. And, you know, this new kind of structure that Microsoft's kind of turning itself into is, you know, cross platform, cloud service, services, platform, that kind of thing, and making it readily available to everyone to use and everyone to kind of broad people who have different, different experiences and different things can also use these things as well. And so, I mean, We've always had really good platforms and services. It's just that people don't want to use them because they kind of have to intermix with other technologies they don't understand. I think that's where we're going is that's where that's where we're making it easier for everybody to kind of use what Microsoft can actually deploy around services and support and Azure and and C Sharp and .NET, really easy languages like .NET languages. Um, I think it's just it's about time that we start doing that and broadening our spectrum, and broadening our scope. And I think that's just where we're going. We're heading. Well, let's leave the philosophy of coding out for just a second because I know it can make people a little bit angry. Instead, let's let's <laughs> jump back into our program. You've got a you've got a great idea. Let's show how the development's going to work. But before that, let's take just a moment to thank the first sponsor of this episode of Coding 101. Now, you know, I, I know there's a lot of people out there who watch a show look like Coding 101, and you say, well, there's a lot of gaps. We, we don't always fill in all the holes, and that's true. Even during this module, you're going to find that we don't give you step by step by step. You do acquire a little bit of base knowledge, and that's just because we can't spend 20 episodes building an app. We need you to find another place to, to fill in your little bits of knowledge holes, those knowledge absences, which is why we're happy to have as part of the show Lynda.com. Now, what is Lynda.com? Lynda.com is a one-stop shop, a repository for knowledge, both of new knowledge and knowledge that you just need a refresher course on. Lynda.com is an easy and affordable way to help you learn. You can instantly stream thousands of courses created by experts on software, web development, graphic design, and more. Lynda.com works directly with industry experts and software companies to provide timely training. Often the same day you get the new releases and the new versions on the street, you'll find new courses on Lynda. So you're always up to speed. 
All courses are produced at the highest quality, which means it's not going to be like a YouTube video with shaky video work or bad lighting or bad audio. They take all that away because they don't want you to focus on the production. They want you to focus on the knowledge. They include tools like searchable transcripts, playlists, and certificates of course completion, which you can publish to your LinkedIn profile, which is great if you're a professional in the field and you want your future employers to know what you're doing. Now, whether you're a beginner or advanced, lynda.com has courses for all experience levels, which means they're going to be able to give you that reference, that place to go back to when you get stumped by one of our assignments. Now, you can learn while you're on the go with the lynda.com apps for iOS and Android, and they've got classes for all experience levels. One low monthly price of $25 gives you unlimited access to over 100,000 video tutorials, plus premium plan members can download project files and practice along with the instructor. And if you've got an annual plan, you can download the courses to watch offline, make it, making it the ultimate source of information. Now, whether you're completely new to coding, or you want to learn a new programming language, or just sharpen your development skills, like for example, let's say you want to start getting into C Sharp because you, you want to write for Visual Studio.net when it becomes available on your platform, lynda.com is the perfect place to go. They've got you covered. They've got new programming courses right now, including the programming the Internet of Things with iOS, building a note-taking app for iOS 8, and building Android and iOS apps with Dreamweaver, CC, and PhoneGap. For any software you rely on, lynda.com can help you stay current with all software updates and learn the ins and outs to be more efficient and productive. And right now, we've got a special offer for all of you to access the courses free for 10 days. Visit lynda.com slash c101 to try lynda.com free for 10 days. That's l-y-n-d-a dot com slash c101. l-y-n-d-a dot com slash c101. And we thank Linda for their support of Coding 101. Now, Lou, take us through this. We talked a little bit about app development uh, in the last module that you were on. And we talked about a, a procedure, a way to program that looked at it from uh, four different things. The first was to look at, at uh, uh, breaking down the functions of the program that we want. So what exactly do we want to be able to do? Uh, the second thing was to gather the resources. So what do we have available to us? What can we use? What things can we, can we uh, put into our environment? The third thing was to create a logic tree for our program so that we knew the steps that we had to program. And the fifth thing was to make every part of that logic tree a reality, actually turn it into code. So take me step by step on what we need to do to, to create Santa's little helper or the, the holiday pricer. You bet. So yeah, I, good outline. So I think basically the first thing is really kind of decide what we, well, I guess what we call in the software industry is the requirements for the app. And I think for me, the requirement for the app would be for me to go to a site, let's say newegg.com, and I go to a product and I notice, okay, I like this product, let's say it's the Intel processor, and I want to go and kind of determine if I want to try to track that price, right? So I'm going to save that URL, I'm going to paste it into this app, and then it should be able to pull up the price. And then from there on out, it should be able to cycle through every time I run the app or maybe periodically throughout the day, it'll go and grab the price from that site. So the idea is I should be able to take a URL, put it in the price into the application, and then it'll just kind of start tracking it. So that's my requirements, I guess you could say, for that. Okay, so we know what we wanted to do. We wanted to go outside. We wanted to find an item. We wanted to track the price. And then at some point, it's going to report to me. I mean, that's, that's that whole view part. It's got to tell me the useful information. Now, the question I would have to you is, what's available? Because I can't just write a program that will surf to a site and start looking for uh, you know, individual items unless I want to write something scripted. I'm assuming you might have something a bit more elegant than that. Exactly. So I think like one of the things that some sites support are some, like some so, so sites like Best Buy or even uh, uh, Amazon or uh, eBay or you name it. Most of them have what we call an API or SDK. I think we kind of saw that a little bit with when we were doing the Google se segment uh, a while back when um, we were talking about using the task API for Google. A lot of these other services like Best Buy, like Amazon, like Google, they all have this API that you can call to kind of get information. So like on the, if you show my screen real quick, I have an example. This is the, the Best Buy API and it's actually really, it's really pretty good API. And all that they require you to do is get a, um, uh, an API ID. It's very similar. You just go sign up and say, I want to get an, a an API ID or key. 
And then every time you call their their service, you just kind of put that in the call and it knows that, okay, this is the person that's actually calling me and they can track you by using that. Um, some of them don't. Like, for instance, uh, the uh, Amazon one, uh, you could, there's an open one and there's a closed one. There's some of them, like the eBay one, they also require an API key because they want to track how much traffic you're kind of putting against their site and stuff. Right. So they want you to have API. Yeah. Actually, 8-Bit Steve in the chat room has a, has a good question. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people asking it, and that is, why would these stores have an API? If you're Best Buy, don't you want people to go to bestbuy.com? Why would you want to publish an API that would allow people to bypass this beautiful website that you spent all this money to create? It's, it's traffic. I mean, they're going to get, I mean, if you're going to price, get some information about a product and pricing from them and that kind of at the very least, you know, designates you to go buy it from them. That's the key is they, they want people buying stuff from them, whether it's being from their website or it's third party through their website. Right. So that's really kind of what they're trying to do is they're trying to open the door for other places like advertisers and so on to kind of point people back to their site. Right. Um, this app is really kind of similar to that. I mean, because if you think about it, I'm getting data from the sites. And then at some point, maybe they might be the minimum or the lowest price and they have the best shipping. And so I might just go and buy it from them, right? So I think that that's kind of the key is why they have APIs. Some of them don't. Uh, like, I'll give you an example. We're going to go through an example of using Newegg. Uh, Newegg doesn't have a public API. And so that, that means there's really two ways to kind of get data from them. One of them is use the APIs that their website uses because their websites right. use an AP, underlying API to get the data. Or you do what they call screen scrape. <laughs> Which um, is always fun. <laughs> that's right. So you basically will take the web page in your app, load the web page up, go through the XML or the HTML that's under the covers and just find the price and then steal the price off the page. And then every time your app will just kind of go out to that site and grab the price every time. So there's multiple ways to do it, but that's the more complex kind of ad hoc way of doing it. Yeah, it's kind of the, the, the kludge to do it. You can use screen scraping, but what I found is uh, if you write a screen scraping program, sometimes it only takes the change of a little bit of formatting to throw your screen scraping program off, and then you've got to go back in and figure out what they changed and now you have, what you have to change on your side to make it work right. But uh, sure. to, to get back to, to uh, the, the quick tip, there are people who may not remember from the first and second C-sharp module what these APIs are. And remember, we, we've, we've actually talked about this concept before, this idea of taking code that you may not have written and then being able to use it by uh, creating an instance of a class. Well, this is what this is. This is essentially taking this code that someone else has written. They've given you a interface, the API, so that in, like in Best Buy's case, you can get a key which gives you access to it. So you can just use a, a few set parameters, uh, and, and hopefully Lou will show us what those parameters are, to call over to the code that Best Buy has run, run and just get back the information that you want. Now, uh, Lou, could you take us through the, the third step? So now we know what we want the program to do. Now we know what resources we have available. We have the, either the API or screen scraping. The third thing that we wanted to do was to create a logic tree. So as you are programming this, as you're thinking about putting this together, what are the, the steps? What are the functions that you are thinking about coding as you, as you go through the problem? You bet. So I think I first start with like the lowest level. So like, for instance, I said, I want to be able to take a URL from a web, from a browser, stick it in the app, and it's going to give me a price. And so what components do we have there? So I think we have a, you know, a URL, which is you know, in C-sharp language is a string. Uh, they do have a, a class that you can wrap around it uh, called a URI, but for right now we'll just call it a string. And then um, also, what, a, what is a price today? A price in most... Um, currency types is a decimal value where you have, uh, you know, a number in the front and then a decimal point and then some numbers on the end. So we'll, we'll basically call it just a regular decimal in C sharp. And so when you, when you actually talk about the API, if you show my screen really quick, um, the API that we actually could build up is, I, I like to call this a price provider. And then I just have two methods, one that will accept a, an item ID or a URI in a case is URL. Um, and it will basically return a decimal of some type. And that will that's kind of like my structure, my, arc, my basic structure of the app. Nice, nice. Okay. So, 
Yep. So it's pretty simple uh, API. And then what, what we could do then is we could build specific instances of that. So like, for instance, I'll pop up with what we call the Best Buy provider. Let me zoom in really quick here. Um, and you'll notice that, again, I have it's a specific prov provider type. But again, it has the two methods that implement it. I'm, I've kind of what we call um, inherited from price provider. Uh, and right away, if I were to build another class down here called, um, you know, uh, the JCPenney <laughs> provider or whatever, right? I could do that and I can immediately uh, call it price provider and inherit from that. And then, whoops, not quotes, but, um, and then the key to this is then when, once I actually hit go, it's going to actually implement the, uh, the interface for me here. So I can hit, Oops. Um, and if I pop back over here, there we go. Right. So right away, it already implemented the two methods for me. Of course, they said they're not implemented, but I'm just going to put code in here, then to go and go, go get that data. So this is kind of my basic structure of my app of what I wanted, wanted to actually do. Right, right. And, uh, I so know people are starting to get a little bit lost in the, in the chat room. Don't worry. Don't freak out. Because remember, we are going to make all this code available. You will actually be able to download exactly what Lou was working on. It will work on your computer, and then you can start poking around. So what we want you to do during these sessions, these next three episodes, where we go over, uh, Sa I'm going to call it Santa's Little Helper just because that name is now stuck in my head. You will be able to, to use the same assets that we have. So don't freak out. And, and don't worry, we're, we're, we're coming back for you. Uh, now, Lou, the, the last part of the, uh, the structure for creating a program was to actually turn that logic tree into code. Uh, I, I want to do that. So I, I want to give you the rest of the time in the episode to actually take people step by step through the first parts of actually using these APIs and using this code to scrape off that information. But before we do that, we do have to take one more break, and then we'll continue nonstop. But I'm happy to do this one because, well, you know, we've been talking a lot about scraping data off the internet, but sometimes you want to be able to present your information. Sometimes you want a slick interface. Sometimes you want to be able to show people your portfolio, your, your new website, your new project. Maybe I should create a website for all the drones that we've been creating. But it's all about location, 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 and it's all about creativity. You don't want to be bogged down by the back end about finding a server, finding a provider, getting the right domain name. Wouldn't it be nice if you could go to one place and have all of that taken care of you for one low monthly price? Well, there is a place like that. It's called Squarespace. Now, Squarespace is that one place you can go on the internet to easily get your project, your portfolio on the internet. And I love Squarespace because they're always improving their platform. In fact, they just released Squarespace 7. That makes getting started much easier. And they, they have a unique web presence that's built up over templates that they give you. It's now more all-in-one, it's simpler to navigate, and it's simpler to operate in one seamless experience. Squarespace 7 allows you easier editing. You can edit on one screen, which means you no longer have to toggle between site manager and preview mode. You can even preview designs in device mode so that you see exactly how it will look on tablets and mobiles. Now, it also offers instant access to professional stock photography from Getty. It's now integrated into the package. They allow direct purchases inside the platform from getting images at just $10 each for your site. No more having to jump out, get an image, import it into Squarespace, make sure all your licensing is taken care of. It's all in one interface. You can get Google branded email with uh, Squarespace 7. So you can have the branded email for your small business. And it's automatically set up when you set up your Squarespace account. They've got templates designed for specific professions, which this, this is a big one. All their templates have been beautiful, but now they give you the option to switch between different classes of templates. You can move between templates for musicians, for artists, architects, chefs. They've designed those templates, those category-specific templates, so that you can find the one that looks right for the project, for the business, for the industry that you're trying to represent. Now, Squarespace 7, the developer platform, is now out of beta, which means that you can customize your site exactly as you wish. If you're a developer, you'll have access to the same platform that Squarespace uses for its own site, complete code control. They also give you e-commerce with all subscription plan levels. That includes the ability to accept donations, which is great for nonprofits, cash wedding registries, and school fund drives. And it's easy to use. I mean, yes, sometimes you'll run into a jam, but it's easy to get it solved because Squarespace offers you support. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they've got an army of folk in their forums giving you self-help articles and video workshops to browse at your leisure. 
It also starts at just $8 a month, so it's not going to blow the bank. And that includes a free domain if you sign up for a year. Uh, the Squarespace portfolio, the Note, Metric, and Blog mobile apps are on-the-go extensions of your website so that you can monitor and make changes from anywhere. They include the hosting, so again, it becomes a one-stop shop. You don't have to worry about buying different services from different providers. It's all from one place. It's all in a Squarespace. Now, here's what we want you to do. We want you to start a free two-week trial with no credit card required and start building your website today. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code C101 to get 10% off and to show your support for Coding 101. And to begin using Squarespace 7 now, existing customers can go to the Setting tab to activate all your new features. We thank Squarespace for their support of Coding 101. A better web awaits, and it starts with your new Squarespace website. Lou, take us home. Let's jump in here. Show us how we're going to access these APIs. You bet. So one of the first things is, you know, kind of understanding how these APIs work and what they actually give back to you. So if you pop over to my screen really quick, I'll show you. This is an example of the Best Buy API where they allow you to, uh, just as they say, search and return product information based off of a description or SKU. And so in retail world, a SKU obviously is, is, in, is a product number in the context of that retailer. So Best Buy uses SKU. SKU uh, Amazon uses what they call ASN, um, and a lot of other sites like uh, Newegg uses a special, you know, their own NZ type slash uh, number that they have. All of them have their own, but most of their APIs they have will return the app, the description of that uh, that item by using that that ID. And so, if you look here, this is what we call the API request in here. And if I, I'll zoom in a little quick so you can see a little bit better, as you'll notice that the API. Um, has some components in here. One of them is like what what type of product it is. In this case, they're, they give an example of a modem, and they're using a little wild card on the end saying, "Give me all modems that you know everything that's that's a modem." Um, they're saying, "Okay, what do I want to show from this request? I want to return the name, the description, the height of it, the width, and then the for they're saying, okay, in this case, the format I want to return is what we call JSON format. Hmm. And so JSON format is a special type of format for data, just like XML is. They call it JavaScript object notation. Um, and it's just a really fancy way of saying, hey, let's represent an object um, using just the special syntax, one of, one of them being these little brackets to kind of designate uh, the breakdown of the product. And you notice like here's a name in quotes, that's an attribute or property of that item, of that product description. So this is just the format that it's going to come back in. Right. And JSON JSON's pretty prevalent in the in the kind of web development world. So looking at the screen, at that 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 first line at the top, the request, that's what you would actually send into their API and you would end it with your API key from Best Buy. Uh, right. And so all you'd have to do is you'd have to write a program so it could properly create this line to send to them. And then down below, that's the data that you get back. So you have to be able to right. parse that into usable information. Right, exactly. And so uh, it, I, I have this old slide from a long time ago, and I wanted to show it really quick. This is just what JSON is and kind of what it looks like is, you know, let's say I have this class in C Sharp called employee. It has a first name and a last name. And then I have employees, which is a list of employees. You notice down here, here's an XML version of it where it has, you know, a list of employees. There's an employee's mm -hmm. root element, and then there's a bunch of employee XML. And then in the JSON version of it, you notice it's a little bit more compact. Um, it has a lot more quotes around it. But again, it, it's just a different way of formatting that data. And people like to use it because it's a lot more compact than XML. And it actually transfers a lot better when it comes to browsers and mobile devices and stuff. So that's kind of the key to why these APIs use it. Now, there's going to be people who say, well, wait a minute. If this is just a, uh, an HTTP request, why do I need to write a program? Why would I want to write this in .NET? But if I remember correctly, .NET has built-in HTTP GET functionality. So you don't have to rewrite most of that code. Exactly. So they, they have uh, the, what they call the HTTP client. And right. you can actually use this if you go uh, into the infamous uh, NuGet repository, uh, and which is this thing that you can actually go to. It's NuGet.org. Um, but you can actually go into the NuGet manager within Visual Studio. And they have this really nice, what we call Microsoft HTTP client libraries. And what this allows you to use is not only on you know, the .NET framework for the desktop, but Windows Phone, Silverlight, uh, Windows, uh, Windows apps for the store. 
and then also as for portable class libraries, which then are things that will really be transferable to like OS X and Android as well. So they give you this ability to kind of use this um, and build apps to basically call and make HTTP requests. It's pretty simple stuff. Right, right. And since it's all built in, it means that basically I just call that library and now I have something built in that I can use to say, uh, with this parameter, this parameter, and maybe my API key, do that. Go ahead and get. Go ahead and post. Do an HTTP GET. Right. All right. Move so, us on. Yep. So the, lots of different APIs. Like for instance, the Best Buy API has the ability to kind of within the URL itself, um, you put what you want. So you'll you'll request in here. Hey, I want. Um, the modem description, and this is exactly what I want to return using my API key in the format that I want. That's just a normal GET request that you can make because you're just using the URL and it's returning some data underneath, which is a response using a JSON. Um, the key here, though, is some APIs don't do that. So, for instance, the Newegg API that they use for their website, they actually uh, post a request, and the request is kind of constructed in a way. Uh, where you can't really tell what it's what what it's actually going on. I'll actually show you what that looks like on the screen here. Um, so this is what the the new API is, and this is the res the request that they're making in the body of the HTTP request. Yes. So you'll notice in here that there's a keyword, and then if anybody's ever been in the new egg, this is kind of like the new egg item ID that they're using. Right. Right. So this is not going to be part of the URL, unfortunately. The URL that they're using is a little different. Um, the URL actually looks like this which is um, they have, you know, the special API URL in there, search.egg, and then query on the end of it. And then they, inside the body of the message, they're posting this special, yeah. this special message. So, to say, so hey. they, Newegg does have an API. It's just not really designed to be a public API. This is sort of their, exactly. you, you can use it because people have figured out how to, how to hit it, but it's not designed to be used just to, to hack yourself a program. Yeah, and honestly, it, it actually is. I mean, it, it's designed for to be hit pretty hard, actually, because they use it for their site. They also use it for any of the apps that they mm. have on all the platforms. So mm -hmm. like Android, uh, Windows st Store, Windows Phone. If you use their app, it is actually built to, to basically get data for items. So the best deals for the day and product, product information, product specifics. That's all comes from using this API. So yeah. yes, it's not public. They don't. Ex they, that means making that public means they can pretty much change it at any point in time and break your app. But is it public to use? I'd say yes because they're using it everywhere else, anyways. But again, you just risk the fact that you might be broken if they decide to change it one day. Yeah, I, I get. It. I get it. Yeah, because it is public. Because anyone outside can access it. It's just I just they don't they don't publish it. They don't advertise right. it like some other sites might. Uh, I, I also, I, I got to ask this, and that is, as someone is looking at which sites they might want to include in, in their program, whatever they create for their Santa's little helper, do you prefer to have sites that will give you back JSON replies? Yeah, I mean, I, I think XML or JSON, those are two formats that are really easily um, used within, especially .NET, Java, any of these application development platforms. And so I think, the ones that can give that back format bat wise is much easier. Now, if they give back, you know, HTML, some of them give back HTML, some, some of them are just RSS feeds where you have to use mm -hmm. like the RSS format, you know, whether, whether it's Atom or whatever. So I, I normally prefer either XML or JSON because it's a little easier to use, but you know, some of the other ones are fairly, fairly self-explanatory too, but I do look for the ones that have XML or JSON. Well, then I guess that's the next question then. If someone is, looking at creating this for, for whatever items that they're looking for this holiday season. What do you suggest they do to find whether or not something has either a publicly advertised or a public but not advertised, or maybe even a private API that they can hit? Sure. Yeah, so I'll, let's talk about the public ones first because those are the easiest ones. So the easiest ones would obviously Bing Google, search for, uh, you know, like JCPenney API, Best Buy API, a Best Buy developer, that kind of thing. And normally you'll come up with a bunch of search results, uh, whether it be third party or the actual site. I usually just do a site search on bestbuy.com or amazon.com and it'll be able to tell you, you know, where you can do. Normally it's a product search API or a product marketing API, they usually call them. Um, but you just do simple searches and find them. 
If you don't find them, like a new eggs case, you'll find a bunch of third party apps that want to charge you for wrapping their non-public or private APIs. In that case, you have to make a decision on whether you want to build your own or figure out what their API is or screen scrape in that case. All right. And, and actually, I found uh, developer forums to be very good at that because if there is a site that has an API but they haven't published anything about it, if it's popular enough, chances are that there are some developers who have already hit it and backwards engineered the API commands. That's uh, right. So, but, but then again, you also have to remember, if you're going to do that, there's always the chance that they're going to change their API with absolutely no notice and no explanation, and suddenly it will break everything. If a company will, yeah. is publicly advertising an API, then it means that they're going to want to keep the support for all the developers. Just I think that's something you want to keep in the back of your mind. You can do it, but it's easier if you choose a company that just wants you to access their data. Right. And I think that's kind of the key, too, is if, you, if you're building an app for a platform today like Android or uh, iOS or Windows Phone, they have this concept of silent upgrades or updates. And so if you really do want to build an app that you want to actually ship to everyone in, in the world and let people use it and um, and you want to use a private API, it doesn't really prevent you. I mean, you can still do it. And then when they do change it, you just have to keep up on it and say, OK, well, I'll go fix the app and deploy an update so people can still use it. I guess that's an alternative if you're really, really kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. But either way, it's really up to you whether you want to use a private or not. We've got uh, Patrick Delahanty, our very own Patrick Delahanty, being a smart arse in the, in the chat room saying, companies changing their APIs and not telling us? No one would do that, <laughs> Google Calendar. Uh, it's, so, yeah, it does happen. Uh, just know that if, it bra if, if your program stop work, stops working, there is a chance that the API may have changed. You may have to just go back to the documentation, figure out what they flipped, and then flip it back. Uh, right. uh, we actually have another question in here from, from M5. He wants to know if uh, this program can look for items by ASIM, ASIM. Not sure what that is, but I think it's some way to actually catalog things. The thing about using a program like this, which is going out to different sites, is you're at the mercy of whatever they catalog their items as. Uh, it's not like every Best Buy and Newegg and Amazon, et cetera, et cetera, aren't going to use the same identifying information for each and every single product, which means you're going to have to do a little bit of legwork, just a little bit, to figure out how the inventory identification works for every site you want to hit. That's uh, right. Yeah. So uh, you could do, there's a concept what we call provider. And so you could have what, they, what we call price provider, and that price provider is different, differentiates between every site there is. And so ASIN, Amazon Standard Identification Number, that one is you can basically have to go and figure out you know, what that number is. And the cool thing about Amazon site is they also can allow you to search by serial number and other things. So if you can kind of be able, if you know what the serial number is for that item, you don't necessarily need to use ASAN. But Best Buy doesn't allow you. They want, they want you to kind of use their SKU number or description. Uh, Newegg, you know, they want you to use their internal, um, they have an internal product ID and an external product ID, so they allow you to search for both. But again, yeah, it's all dependent on these sites and what they're re what they how they track things retail wise on the back end. And honestly, it would be a little strange if you said, "Hey, Newegg, could you use the same tracking numbers as Amazon so it makes it easier for me to compare and see which one I'm going to buy from?" I mean, that's, that's right. not really what they're. You can do that. You can do that on your back end, but they won't do it for you. Uh, <laughs> Lou, next week. So we've been talking about the APIs this week and how we get that information. But next week, you're actually going to take this information and bring it into the program. You're going to show us how to do that, right? Exactly right. Yeah, we're going to we're going to try to pinpoint three or four different APIs. One of them that's really hard and that doesn't have a really kind of public API, and then a couple other ones that are public and how we actually use that and utilize it and save it. Lou Maresca, senior developer with Microsoft. It is so good to have you back in the Code Warrior seat. Uh, could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you? Make sure they know where you, they can find you on Twitter, of course, at Lou MM, and where else they might find your work when you're not being our Code Warrior. You bet. So a quick plug, obviously, Visual Studio. Check it out, visualstudio.com. Uh, check it out, the new open source versions, the 2015 versions. And also all my work is at crm.dynamics.com. Lou Maresca, our Code Warrior, sir. We salute you. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Now, folks, I know that this was a lot of information. It always is whenever we get to the code modules. Uh, we tried to take it really slow because people were having trouble with APIs last time. So we tried to explain each and every single step. We're going to repeat it on next week's episode. But remember, you can always go to our show page at twit.tv slash code. When you go there, you'll find not just all of our episodes, 
but our show notes. And most importantly, you will find a link where you can download the package, the code, the, the framework that we've been using in order to create this, which means you can, you can actually run the program out of the box. After you unzip it, you'll be able to run Santa's little helper and, uh, and figure out exactly how it works. Uh, we want you to have these assets because as we go on in episodes and as we add little bits and pieces of knowledge to the project, we want you to be able to, to fool around with it break it, stretch it, make it do something we didn't tell you to do, and then post it to our Google Plus community. You can find our Google Plus community at plus.google.com slash twitcoding101, or, uh, or just go to Google Plus and search for coding 101. If you post it in that community, I will be pulling examples to show off in the next episode. So if you've got a change you made to Santa's Little Helper, or if you want to show us what you did with your API keys, that's a great place to do it. Make sure you drop over. Remember, Twit Coding 101 on Google+. Don't forget that you can also find me on Twitter at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. If you follow me, you'll be able to find out what I'm doing each week for Coding 101. I always tweet out the night before what the next project's going to be. And you'll be able to suggest guests that you want on the show in the future. In fact, the guests that we had for the interviews came directly from requests made by my Twitter followers. So follow me on Twitter and be part of the Coding 101 experience. Don't forget that we do this show live every week, Thursdays at 1.30 p.m. Pacific time at live.twit.tv. If you watch live, you'll get to see the pre-show, the post-show, and everything in between, so you can see the bloopers that get edited out of the downloaded version. And as long as you're watching live, jump into our chat room at irc.twit.tv. You guys are right down there so I can actually talk back and forth with you during the show. If you've got questions about what we're doing, if you need us to slow down, that's the place to go, irc.twit.tv. I want to thank everyone here at the Brick House who makes this show possible, to Lisa and to Leo, and of course, to my fantastic uh, code warrior, Lou Maresca, and my TD. Uh, I'm not sure if he has a camera on himself, but, uh, oh, there we go. Cranky Hippo, could you please tell people where they could find you on the Twit TV network? Uh, they can find me doing a show with you uh, called Know How on Thursdays, just uh, before Marketing Mavericks, which was the show before this. And uh, check out all that drone stuff that we've been doing. Drone. Thank you very much. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballasare. End of line. <laughs>